Right. Well, the spirit of the way. It was always the spirit of the way, from those earliest Minoans and Cretan and Thracians that brought the mysteries to, to Greece. And then, of course, our beloved Apollo, bringing the Cretan priests again up to Delphi. Sorry? Oh, right. And all in the search of something that we all want, but we can't quite find. So pursuing the spirit of the way into the Christian era, which is the one we know most about, I constructed this. Are you all hearing OK? Is it not too noisy? OK, fine. It's rather personal. It's, yes, there'll be history, yes, there'll be art, but there's also be a little bit more. I want you to go away feeling very positive and, and enhanced and, 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 in, and enlightened and uplifted, particularly as you're living down here in Cape Town. I had a dream last night, like moonlight, through the window of my cell. It fell on me not so big as to fill one night, but large enough to fill the rest of my life. And those words were written by a young man who'd been pretty much in solitary confinement for nearly 12 years in a 17th century jail in the 1600s in England. And his name was John Bunyan. He was imprisoned for the horrible crime of preaching gospel without license. As he was just married when he went into jail, he was there for 12 years, of course he dreamed of a journey out. He was let out for six months and began writing The Pilgrim's Progress, and then he was arrested again. It's been translated into hundreds and hundreds of languages. So many journeys begin in very difficult places, maybe not in a prison, but, or maybe, but, but in a spiritual desert. In fact, a desert is a very good place to start a journey because it's quiet and you're alone. The early medieval welcome, the, 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 the phrase on the pilgrimage, was not Buon Camino, it was Ultrea. And Ultrea means beyond, go on, go on, go beyond, you would say as you're walking along. They say about the Camino that you have to be drawn and not driven. And that's very true, because nobody who's driven will ever learn anything on the Camino. And you're looking at a beautiful Romanesque Christ from the Codex Calictinus, which is, in fact, the very first book about the Camino. And he holds up his hand like that, and you will see the sacred three you will see that as a symbol of the Trinity. You may notice that, uh, that, that his halo is blue and not gold. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Did you want to go further back? In order, oh, she's going. Um, blue and not gold, blue being a color of wisdom in the mystical tradition of Christ, of Christian art. So I've included a few of my own little artworks. I hope you don't mind. Um, so many people have said that they simply woke up one morning and they knew they were going to do this. They didn't know how, or how they were going to, as it were, put the brake on their normal life. They knew that they would go. And somehow, this idea that the Camino speaks through your subconscious mind, a lot of people feel that. So this is a little psalter that I've made, which really has no words. Um, and in this particular page, I was thinking about the words of the book of Job in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, he may speak in their ears. And actually, quite by chance, of course, I have the sacred three, the gesture and the light coming from hand. Well, the person who dreamed a very big dream was Charlemagne, and he was the king of the Franks 
and the head of the Holy Roman, em the Holy Roman Empire. And his dates are right there for you, 742 to 814 AD. And what's interesting about those dates is that that was the most critical time for Europe. And also, it me shows you that he died before the bones were found officially. So the first night, he had a dream on two nights. For the first night, he just dreamt about the sky. And he dreamt about an incredible starry path that seemed to pass right over France and right over Spain. Well, he didn't know what it meant, but it was the Via Lactea, the Milky Way. And it was the, the way that the Celts had followed uh, for centuries in order to go to the end of the world. But Charlemagne didn't know what this meant. But the next night, he, went, he had another dream. And the next night, a figure appeared to him. And this is an amazing image I'm going to show you. A figure appeared to him and said, I am James, servant of Christ. I am brother of Zebedee, sorry, son of Zebedee and brother of John the Evangelist, appointed by God's grace to preach his law, who Herod slew. Look you, my body's in Galicia, but no man knows where, and the Saracens oppress the land. Therefore, God sends me to recapture the road that leads to my tomb and the land wherein I rest. The starry way that you saw in the sky signifies that you shall go into Galicia at the head of a mighty host, and after you, all people shall come in pilgrimage, even to the end of time. Well, it has a lovely apostolic ring to it, don't you think? It seems to take us straight to the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And the idea that the word has to travel and has to go to the very ends of the earth. The ends of the earth, well, that translates into Finisterra, it was the end of the known world. Well, many people followed, um, and so many very great men, Francis of Assisi, Isabel of Castile, uh, um, the Pope, John Paul II, Mother Teresa, and countless ordinary people, saints and sinners alike, millions in fact, tramped for weeks, months, and years across Europe to follow the way. And you remember that Charlemagne, when he retreated, his Roland, who was guarding his rear guard, was ambushed in a cleft of the mountain right behind the Abbey of Roncesvalles. And he blew his horn, and he blew his horn, and nobody came. And I went down that, down that cleft on my bottom. It was very steep and rocky. Um, the rain was coming, and I was alone, and I, I didn't even know if I was in Spain or France or if I'd ever arrived at the Abbey. When I saw the Abbey through the trees with the rain coming, I felt like a pilgrim that had been rescued. So you can imagine these thousands of pilgrims over the centuries um, sleeping in huddles, maybe around campfires. Um, I love the way they've all given themselves halos, or rather I've given them halos. And as you, you can see that somehow in, the, in, in their mind, there are the rivers that they're crossing, the rivers that they're crossing, the stony way that they're following, the rain pouring down, as the starry nights, the mountains, the moon rising, the tears on the way. And I, again, those words of Psalm 68 come to mind, even while you sleep among the campfires. The wings of my dove are sheathed with silver, its feathers of flaming gold. There's always a sense that somehow the spirit of the way <coughs> may be personified by the wings of the dove are always with you. Well, your pilgrimage then is a journey that's never been done before. It's yours. It is your Camino. However many thousands of people have walked the way, no one has ever walked your Camino. And in that sense, it does remind us of the mysteries where I mentioned that Every one of those mystai had a completely original and unique experience. That was the secret, that there was no secret, 
but everybody had an individual experience. It's the same with the Camino. So it's your Camino, and you will walk on it. And as you walk, you will ha always have the sun behind you because you're walking west. So as you rise at dawn, as the sun comes, wherever you walk, you will put your feet into your own shadows. As a dear priest at one of these stops, and he said, you know you are walking into your own past, don't you? Yes, Father. Well, you're actually stepping into your own shadows. Yes, Father. Don't worry, when you get there and turn around, all you will see will be the light. It's a nice little allegory, but it's the sort of thing that people think. Um, well, you have only one friend, really, and that is your stick. And you, a pilgrim will put their stick out there and move with the stick step by step by step by step. Taking the cockle in the Middle Ages meant becoming a pilgrim, and it was a very big commitment. You would leave your land, your families, your work, and everything. And you would wear the cockle shell. And this particular shell, it's very moving, is actually from the 1100s. This actual shell. And as you can see, all the, all the little lines of the, um, of the shell point to one place. It's as if all directions lead you to the point uh, to Santiago and to the salvation of your soul. But if you turn the shell upside down, then you see all the rays pouring out when it seems to then become the rays of the rising sun, Finisterra. Now, I was fascinated, and I hope you will be, to discover on the Eleusinian coins, um, to discover this very self-same shell, which can tell us really that the symbol of the shell was a very important pilgrim symbol long before the time of St. James. And that is the coin that I showed you on Monday. You can see it very, very clearly there. When we look at Christian art, we see the shell, and I think the most meaningful painting that I can show you is the Supper at Emmaus by Michelangelo da Caravaggio, painted between 1595 and 1601 um, in Rome. And it, it tells the story of the Sunday night after the resurrection, after the tomb is found empty. The story is only told in the book of Luke. So, they're in the inn, they're having a meal, when the stranger that's been walking with them blesses the food. And something in the attitude makes them realize who they are with. This is an extraordinary painting, painted by a very disturbed, very angry, very troubled young man. And after this painting, you know, he never made any more pagan paintings, never made any more mythological paintings. So the figure of Christ is in red and white, as is normal in his post-resurrection paintings. The red, of course, is the color of sacrifice and sin and redemption, the white, the color of the Holy Spirit. And as the figure looks down, he looks down at the basket. The basket is really us, because the basket is a memento mori. Everything in that basket rots. This is life, this is the world. And he smiles and he says, um, sorry, that's it. Mm. Um, but he raises his hand over the bread, um, I am the bread of life. Of course, there's a very big gap in the composition deliberately left for anybody in 1602 who saw the painting, or indeed in 2017. And the gap is right here. And that gap there is left for you and I and anyone else who wants to go to the table. Now, Cleophas is making this fantastic gesture which on the one hand brings us into the painting, but more important, it's an attitude of shock. And you will see right on his jerkin, the shell, which I hope you've been looking at. Well, in painting, there's no such thing as a set time. Time is very elastic in artworks. So the pilgrimage existed, but it didn't exist on the night of the Supper of Emmaus. And certainly Caravaggio would have known about it. The shell there says Cleophas is already a pilgrim in his heart. And as he reaches out like that, he is also reaching out to us. I just thought we could think about this triad. If you look at this corner of the painting, you see the hand, the shell, and the knot. Can you all see quite clearly that? 
So if you think about that metaphysically, if you like, the hand reaches out. This is the reaching out. The hand reaches out. The shell become, is the pilgrim, is becoming a pilgrim. The quest and the knot is the purpose of it, because the knot symbolizes wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon. So in this little corner of the painting, um, Caravaggio has shown us something important. If we just go back, we will also see that he's very secretly put in a sign that tells me he'd been down into those catacombs recently discovered and seen the fish ichthus on the walls, which was the earliest symbol of Christ. And there you see the fish, but it's in the shadow of the fruit bowl. After this painting, Caravaggio's life changed. So we go on now in the Middle Ages through the Carolinian times and all through that, those dark times, the whole of Europe was covered with thick, thick, dark forest. And it was very dangerous to go anywhere. If you left your castle keep or the city walls or the beloved walls of your abbey, you really did risk your life. So the, the forest would have been full of all sorts of dangers in those deep mists, with wolves, with bears, witches, warlocks, mendicant friars, lepers, beggars, um, pardoners. And the medieval mind would conjure a universe alive with demons and demonic forces, but also angels of light. Now, the church encouraged a terrible fear. Uh, these carvings are carved by ordinary people, just ordinary people in villages and towns. And you can see the incredible psychological terror in these images. Absolutely, particularly the one at the bottom. It is perhaps interesting the church did exactly the opposite of what the Eleusinian mysteries did. The mysteries freed people from the fear of death, but the church encouraged a terrible fear because when you died, that wasn't the end. You would burn in a lake of sulfur. What you, the only thing to do was to seek for the salvation of your soul. And to do that, you had to get as, clear, as close as possible to anything that had been as close as possible to Christ, anything, anything at all, even if it wasn't what people said it was the handkerchief of the Virgin or a tear of the Virgin or anything. But, but the, Jane, the, bo the bones of Christ's brother were surely, of course, the greatest. A Christian souls are weighed in the scales and found wanting. And the only, look at the terror in this. It's the only way to overcome that would be to seek salvation. The church gave everybody that chance. But the world was flat and there were no proper maps. And if they were, you couldn't read them. The entire world practically was illiterate. So this is the sort of map. The, the, the pilgrimage was already 300 years old before this map was made. People just had to trust that the way was known. Um, in the Middle Ages, the whole of Europe was covered with pilgrim routes. And this is a, ma a map showing the pil pilgrim routes in the Middle Ages. And you see all over Europe, and of course also all over England, uh, from Canterbury, and as you look at all these maps, at all these routes, you have to realize people could only do this in groups. It was too dangerous. So they would meet together in groups. Those groups would be bigger groups. And it was like tributaries coming down. In the middle of the map, you might see, you might see Cluny. Can you see Cluny? Now, it's very conveniently right in the middle of the map. But it's also right in the middle of this part of Europe. And the trouble was that Rome was too far away. Rome was too far south. The Vatican was too far to be able to develop the pilgrimage and to control what was going on in this part of the world. So they handed this job to the Abbey of Cluny. And there it was the Benedictine order was founded by St. Benedict of Nursia. There he is. And this is Cluny. Cluny was an incredibly rich foundation because they had a prayer ministry. 
and you could have prayers and masses said. Of course, you paid. It was very rich. So Clooney was given special dispensation by Vatican to develop the pilgrimage. And that's why it's called the Camino Frances, the French pilgrimage. That's interesting. So many French went down and crossed over the Pyrenees to go on the way that by the time Louis XIV came along, who was a worldly man, if nothing else, he actually banned the French from going on the pilgrimage. That's ironic, seeing the French the monks actually developed it. So as you come down then, you, they crossed over the Pyrenees here at two points, and then this is the main route up to Santiago, going northwest, and lots and lots of tiny towns springing up all the way along the way. The problem was this. This slide, this image, tells you very, very clearly what the Vatican was very, very worried about. In 711 AD, Islam crossed the Mediterranean near Gibraltar and very, very quickly went through Spain like a forest fire. There you just see that was the extent of the Islamic occupation of Spain, which had been a Christian country. Um, as you could see, the goal was Paris. Well, the goal was Paris. So the, the, normal, the people of, the, of your wouldn't have known about this particularly, but the Vatican knew, and they were extremely, extremely worried. In fact, this map shows you how far away Rome is. So it was Tariq, who was a freed Algerian slave from, uh, from North Africa, from Algeria, and he was a recent convert to Islam, burning with fervor, and he was invited over by the son of the king, of the Visigothic king. And he took just 400 men. And it was just a doddle. It was so easy that he went back, came over with another 1,000 men, and burnt the boats. So it was Africans and not Arabs that brought Islam into Spain. But as soon as they'd taken control of southern Spain, Yemeni Arabs came over and took control. So all the caliphs were, in fact, Arab. The one caliph here in 1094 um, was actually made caliph at six years old. But this is a wonderful painting and gives you some idea of the force which came over and crossed into Europe. Now, this is how it looked only nine years later. They'd gone right through the whole of Spain and, extraordinarily enough, had crossed the Pyrenees. These are North Africans and Arabs. They're not used to the kind of rain and cold. Crossed the Pyrenees up there, and they had destroyed Narbonne. Narbonne, a very great Roman city, established by the Romans, Narbonensis, a capital and a very big trading city. And they also totally destroyed Carcassonne. So it was an acute situation, and not only did the Muslims believe, but the Christians believed that the arm of Muhammad was giving these people the power. The arm of Muhammad was in Cordoba. Now that news, of course, reached the church. They knew all about everything. I mean, the church knew everything. And the idea was we have to find something, a stronger relic, a more powerful relic. It's no good armies. Armies are not going to do it. And so the search, the thought was on. And then, just to show you another map, by 750, the whole of this part was under Islamic control. Of course, most of it is desert, most of it is desert down here, it's to be desert. And the easiest way to Paris or Europe is not this way, through all the, through the Alps and through all these mountainous regions of the Balkans and through all that. The easiest way is straight across the flat desert and over. You can see it. Well, with that, all those Roman uh, cities of North Africa that were great, great centers of culture, I particularly weep for the ghost of St. Augustine because his city was Carthage. He, there was a great school of philosophy at Carthage. And all those great cities, Alexandria, the city of, you know, the city of origin of Clement of Alexandria, of Tertullian, of all these people, um, Carthage, Leptis Magna, 
um, all of the Cyrene, Cyrene founded by the Minoans, I mean by the Cretans, all of that was completely wiped out, and I don't think it's ever really come recovered. So that was the situation. What was needed was a very important relic right there. So the bones of St. James were found in 823 AD in a star, in a, in a field under a star, and they were found right there at the end of the Via Lactea, which took you pretty much to Finisterra. The route already existed in a sense because the Celts had been walking it for centuries, and indeed the Romans used it for trading. Um, I know I'm going to upset people, it's a difficult situation. Most people would say there are no bones there. The clergy at Santiago themselves always said there were no bones there when they were talking to other clergy, like English clergy in the 17th century, we have records. It was a move to try and save Europe. However, I believe the bones are there. Now, if you remind me, I'll tell you at the end. I believe the bones are there for a very interesting and complex reason. So, pilgrims, the church's answer to this tremendous, powerful and frightening thing was a praying pilgrim and the word, the word. So this pilgrim is reading, that's very unusual. He's obviously, he's a monk. He's, and um, you walk along with your stick and you read and you pray. Well, when you have millions of people walking along the route, praying, singing, calling on the word, you have a real cordon sanitaire, a real glass barrier that will somehow block this advance. What's more, every night in Christendom will go down to protect that route. Now, the word is interesting because every single word, every single letter that was written before the Gutenberg Bible was written by human hand. That's absolutely an incredible thought. And with the words being so precious, they were locked up in libraries, chained to desks, sometimes even the pages poisoned so that if people tried to... The word was very, very precious. Um, very few people could read. And even Charlemagne himself, Charlemagne the Great, Charlemagne was illiterate. It didn't matter because you had the church. And the church all spoke the same language. And they could go anywhere and meet people that they could talk to. Where, you know, a German monk could speak to an English monk, could speak to an Italian monk, Latin. So the knowledge of Latin, the exclusivity of reading, the, the exclusivity of the word, which was mostly in the abbeys and not in any secular places, except for a few princes, all of that kept the power of the church. Um, when I look at this picture of pilgrim, it's idealized, of course, but it reminds me to say that the pilgrimage was sometimes used in a very wrong way. It was used to punish people. People who'd done some terrible thing could be condemned to do the pilgrimage from Canterbury to Santiago, in which case they would not be able to work during that time. They'd leave their families and everything else. Um, some um, prisoners or vagrant, you know, prisoners who being, would come from village to village, and as they entered the villages, they'd be beaten by the local people. If you were, conde if you were condemned, or rather, what do you call it, sentenced, to, to go to Santiago, and if you were rich, you could get somebody else to go for you, and it would cost a pound to, to, for them, but they had to come back again. Of course, there was no way of getting back except walking. So it would cost a pound. But if you'd done something terrible and you were a very senior bishop, you would then uh, might be, have to go to India, to the bones of St. Thomas, and then it would cost you 60 pounds. But it didn't matter because nobody ever came back from India. <laughs> Pay them. Um, if you'd done something medium bad, you might get condemned to go to Rome. That cost four pounds. But the point was, it was that that was a bad thing. But they did have protection on the way. They were freed from tolls, and they had special protected status, exactly like the pilgrims going to Eleusis on the pilgrim ships. Remember, I told you about the pilgrims came from far and wide to go to Eleusis, and they had protected status. So pilgrims came, and they walked. And there's always been the kind of myth that some of them walked bare barefoot, which is a terrible thought. So here we see a barefoot pilgrim. I couldn't believe that when I saw that. 
but yes, a barefoot pilgrim, and an, another little row of barefoot pilgrims shuffling along in all the rocks and the dust and the thorns. Extraordinary. And then I was quite shocked to see that I myself would see a real barefoot pilgrim. And this girl has just about arriving at the lighthouse at Finisterre. She has 50 yards to go, and she will have done it, arrived. And she's walking along barefoot because every single thing she had was stolen, everything. Backpack, boots, everything. But she still carried on. She went. So that's not a particularly scary picture. The foot was actually blue when I took that picture. Uh, was, you can see lots of calluses and blisters and everything else. Um, everybody had shin splints and blisters and, and terrible feet problems. And Matt, I saw a blister that big on the uh, base of a foot for uh, things. And um, it's all about feet. It's all about feet. But you know, you are in Catholic Spain. And you are constantly reminded of the Christian story. And so though the pilgrimage is all about feet and pains in the feet and blisters and all the things that happen, the fact that you can't walk, there are always much worse reminders of pains in the feet. This cru crucifixion is in Pamplona Cathedral. And when I looked at it, I looked at it and I looked at it again. And it's not French, it's not, it's not Italian, but it ties in with the convention that existed in medieval art in Italy. And I know that because I've seen it in the work of Fra Angelico, who lived in the convent of San Marco in Florence. And that is that the blood comes down in four streams. One, two, three, four. Can you all see that clearly? Right. <sighs> So that's not just an accident. And I thought, that doesn't make sense. Three is the sacred number, or maybe seven, or 12. Um, why on earth four? And then I thought and thought, and sleuthed and sleuthed, and I went back to the early church, as one must always do. And I looked at some of the very early things from the third, second and third century. And on the sarcophagus here, which is in San Clemente in Rome, or it used to be, you will see the Lamb of God, the Agnes Dei, standing on the Mount of Golgotha, and you will see from the Mount of Golgotha four streams of water. Can people see that? One, two, three, four. Um, flanked on both sides by palm trees and with the Cairo behind his head. The four streams of water flow from the Mount of Golgotha, and later on in the Middle Ages, they turn into four streams of blood as the imagery becomes more real and less um, symbolic. You see, when this was made, it was not possible to show Christ as a man and because of the second commandment. And the church, the early church was, was Jewish, as you all know. And so we have Christ shown as everything else but a man, a lamb, um, a fish, whatever, lots of different signs. The four streams represent the four streams of paradise that rose from the headwaters in Eden and watered the world. And of course, the tree in the center of the garden is the same tree in the book of Revelation, the tree that is in the middle of the city of God, that's St. Augustine's Civitas Dei. And from the, the roots, the tree stands on the river of life. So it's all about the river of life flowing in four streams. And as you go from that, you go back. You can now see the link. Can you all see it? So these are the sort of thoughts, the sort of things you think about going along. Now, the way is very, very stony. And it's stony in all sorts of different ways. But fundamentally, it's stony. And as you go, you may pick up a stone and put it down on one of the way markers as a little something as a little votive, as a little offering. And you will frequently see piles of stones. You see, people have nothing. A real pilgrim should have absolutely nothing, not even her name or his name, nothing, nothing at all. You must go with nothing. How can you take in anything if there's nowhere for anything to come in? So that is this whole thing. The stripping down is one of the first things. And these stones, all you have is an offering. You see another little pile of stones there. And this, I'm very, very annoyed about this, somebody scratching on that. But so you're only 100 miles from Santiago right now at this point. 
So the way is very stony. And again, that would constantly remind me of ideas, of, of thoughts. And perhaps the words of Psalm 91, he shall command an angel concerning you to guard you in all your ways. He shall lift you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Isn't that wonderful? And this is the archangel Raphael taking Tobias home with the liver of the fish to heal the blindness of his father. Um, as they walk, they tiptoe through a path that is littered with very big stones. The stone, of course, Tobias wants to be an angel, so his cloak flares up behind him and takes on the shape of a wing. Can you see it? It's rather sweet. This, of course, is from the workshop of um, Hoferocchio, and two wonderful people were in that workshop together, Leonardo and Botticelli. Botticelli was seven years older. So some of this may have got into Botticelli. It's very Botticellian, in fact. In this painting, made in Cologne by an anonymous monk, we have the way looking very stony again. And this is St. Um, St. Hubert, who's been out hunting, as all proper princes do every morning. And um, he, is, he suddenly sees, he sees a stag coming out of the forest, and he sees the crucifix in the horns of the stag. But it's more, I think, the innocence of the stag. Something touches him, and he fall, jumps off, and, and something changes. And this painting is very interesting, because the way that he's going to choose is very stony, but the way that he's come down from is, has got no stones at all. So his castle is up there. And of course, he can't see where he's going because they're all blind corners. So he'll go in faith. And the painting is divided very clearly down here, where there's no compositional link between the two sides, like the spine of a book. And the page that's turning over to the left, the left is the dark side. I told you that yesterday. The left is the side of destruction and darkness and crookedness. And guess what? On the left, we have the groom. And he's very crooked and twisted. His figure's completely twisted. That's his back, the feet are facing forward. And he's very dark. And what's worse, he engages us. He is the one that looks out. So let's say Brother Fritz, who every year is, paints his painting because he knows, even in 2017, where we're likely to be. So the painting opens out like that, with a wonderful light on this side. And this is like a lace lace up that links and pulls together these two images. So the stony way. So the archangel then leads Tobias, and I found this in Santo Domingo della Calzata, and the archangel's conveniently telling Tobias the way to go. However, the archangel wasn't always very clear. And these are the yellow flashes. I remember distinctly standing there and looking at that and thinking, great. Um, yes, OK, so what, you know. Uh, so the, sometimes it's not clear, and sometimes the way the decision becomes positively loaded with moral significance. For example, here. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> of course, being a KP born in the winelands of the Cape, it wasn't going to be very difficult for me to decide which way to go. So I head for the bar. Luckily, a lot of other people have fallen from grace as well, and, and we are not on our own. So the famous boots, the, your very best friends, um, that, that take you and take you every single step of the way. Well, let's say, as it's very early, I know it looks very dark up there, but you, you, you are getting up very early in the dark. And you might look around over your shoulder and you might think, this is mad. I'm walking into the dark, and I should be going out that way. And it's so tempting to go back. It's, go back. You know, go on. You've got a nice life. You've got everything else. But no, it's very dark. And you are walking forward. And then you have this incredible open space, which is wonderful, but also frightening. And it's what everybody in really wants. People want to know where they're going and the way is where you're going. And you may not see it quite as clearly as that today, but the way is there, and it's straight, and it's open, and you're going there. And you're not following a figure or instructions or anything else. You're just following the way. 
And if you do get lost on the way, you find yourself very quickly. It's quite extraordinary. I only got lost once or twice. I got lost twice. I knew I was lost, and then I just found my way back. So you set out in the morning, and you are out in this beautiful openness. And this, of course, must have been what John Bunyan was always dreaming about. And as I walk along, I thought about that little song. It kept going round in my mind. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead, the road has gone, and I must follow if I can. Those are the immortal words of Bilbo Baggins of Bag End, who lives in the Shire, Middle Earth. And I put that in very specially for my brother, who is here today and had a badge which said, Frodo lives which he was inseparably war for years. So that, those are the words, Bilga, from Bilga Bang. It's a little song. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. It goes on like that. So you're in this tremendously bleak open space, and the way is rugged and drenched with water, and the gurgling of frogs keep you company all the way along. Sometimes the fields were positively laden with water, and I had the feeling that it might be easier to catch the sense of water if we made a drawing of it. So here I made a little drawing, um, and it just shows the sky laden with water and water pouring down. And of course, I'm drawing it as I'm standing in a tiny thing with a little black filled pen. Just a quick, quick drawings as we go along, or the windy way going through Navarra towards Vienna, uh, just tiny little things made as we walk along. Sometimes it is so bleak and so empty and so frightening, and you do think about one of the one of the um, lessons, which is one of the lessons of Camino, is how to cope with being alone. But you're not really alone because when you need somebody, somebody just turns up. I'll tell you a few stories. But look how bare and rugged it is. And he's just said those words of that thing, though in a bare and rugged way, through devious lonely wiles I stray, thy, thy bounty shall my pains beguile, with sudden green and herbage crowned, and streams shall murmur all around. And though in the path of death I tread, with gloomy horrors overspread, my steadfast heart shall fear no ill, for thou, O Lord, art with me still. And suddenly the whole Camino bursts into flowers, and poppies are everywhere, every ditch, every roadside, and this incredible yellow broom, um, freezing cold, of course, and this was walking up to Ravenal, which is, in fact, the English um, albergue on the Camino. It's run by the Confraternity of St. James. So freezing cold, everything blooming, and there you are. But as you go along, you do wonder how it is that this route has been remembered. Remember, no, no question of, of maps and what do you call these sort of satellite things. The way it was remembered, and sometimes it is quite literally as thin, as narrow as a table mat. And yet the way has been remembered. And it's been remembered from the ninth century, so over 1,300 years. And in this deep uh, forest, you can hear the nightingales. The nightingales sing all the time. But you can imagine being in this forest as a medieval pilgrim, and you might think, I need an angel. What I need is an angel. And so you might just conjure up a little angel who will be your companion on the way. Then, of course, Romanesque art is everywhere. It is the richest source of Romanesque art anywhere in Europe, because pilgrimage developed through the period of the high point of Romanesque art. And here is a little angel um, in a sort of rejoicing attitude, very primitive, um, who will look after you. Another very primitive Christ, looking pathetic with very wobbly legs and half the halo missing, but the hands are particularly large. And then the Cairo, which was the, the image that came to Constantine in a dream, which is the Kai, and the Rho, the Cairo, the first letters of Christ's name, the Rho is the R, there's a sigma there. And with Alpha Omega, the Alpha and Omega, um, this was the first important image, the first important symbol of Christ. And when Constantine saw it in a dream, 
he heard the words, and tuto nike, by this sign, conquer all. And he won the battle. So when you're going along, you may just see, even on a very early um, tympanum like this, here is the Cairo, right there, and the tetramorphs. The tetramorphs are the animals that represent the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, the winged man, uh, Mark, the lion, Luke, the bull, and the eagle is John. What struck me as odd about this is that they are going in an anti-clockwise direction. This is, by the way, in Estelia. So they're going in an anti-clockwise direction, and they very often do in the early imagery. And that doesn't work for me, because that's going to the left. Um, but I was helped. I actually had a wonderful job. I taught at the university in Aix-en-Provence. Um, I taught Gothic and medieval art. And Aix-en-Provence is on the pilgrim route. Um, in fact, I stayed in a tiny house that had a little Saint-Jacques over the door because it was right at the city entrance where the pilgrims came and stayed before they went up to the Cathedral of St. Saviour. And when I just, with my class, I was trying to understand this, and somebody said, doesn't Hebrew go backwards? Which, of course, it does, which could explain why they're going that direction. So near, near Borgos is an immensely important abbey, the Abbey of Silos. And the Abbey of Silos has been there for a very long time and is still um, a living abbey with monks who chant and sing. These are the cloisters of the abbey. And the monks sing only plain chant, nothing else. There are no words. If you go to the abbatical church, you will not hear any sermons or any words or any liturgy or anything. They sing, they chant for an hour. So this, you can see the Romanesque capitals, and these are some of the finest Romanesque artworks in the world, and particularly in the Camino, the incredulity of Thomas, shown there in the Silos Cloister. But one of the reasons it's so important, it was um, where Beatus of Libana was, and he promoted the pilgrimage, and his dates, as you can see, are very early. And this is from the Silos Apocalypse. I'm showing you only one image because I wanted to try, I want to try in this very last talk to bring you into the mystical tradition of the Christian tradition, but also show you the things of the time. And this is an amazing image because it predates the rise of Mary, in a sense. Christ is there. Um, he is holding up the gospel because peasants believed, people believed, and it was a dark world. You had no electricity and no light. People believed that real light poured out of the gospel. And you, if you hold up the gospel, real, they believe real light poured out of it. And the light is pouring down onto the heads of the pilgrims' faces there. Um, yellow is the color of, well, it's called Flavus. It's the color of mercy. And then the sky is red and not blue because it is absolutely full of the love of God. The, the, the color red is the color that represented the love of God. And then around the figure of Christ are seven clouds. So we're back to the sacred seven here. The seven clouds swirling around to take you back to that seven, which of course is the number of the Holy Spirit. So all of this coming together in this amazing image. Now we can't do the Camino without encountering the Templars. And it was Bernard of Clairvaux who gave them their rules and their orders, which were very, very severe, as you can imagine. And he said, a Templar knight is truly a fearless knight and secure on every side. His soul is protected by the armor of faith as his body is protected by the armor of steel. And the Knights Templars were an amazing organization, international. They were warrior monks, aristocrats mostly, warrior monks, and they protected pilgrims on the way, first on the way to Jerusalem, but also very much on the way to Santiago. I was interested to see that when Richard the Lionheart, that's Richard I of England, led the First Crusade, only 30,000 men, and they didn't just go to Jerusalem and fight a battle, they fought every step of the way to get there. Um, after that, Jerusalem blossomed into a city as great as Paris. Population grew, it became a great center. But the road from Jaffa to Jerusalem was littered with the bones of pilgrims, and that is what inspired the Templars to set up their organization. This great, temple, this great um, castle is in Pomferrada, 
built by the Knights Templars and still standing. So the Templars built their churches as octagonal baptistries. And for quite a while, I was confused about that. This is the most amazing octagonal baptistry called Unate near Orbanos. Those who've walked the pilgrimage will know about Unate. And it's an amazing, there it is in the valley. Sorry, I'm in front there, but that's a picture of it sitting right in the valley, apparently on ley lines with a hermitage next door to it where you can stay. The reason that the baptistries were octagonal when we think, obviously, seven should be the right number, is because the number eight is the number of the resurrection. And the number eight is the new life, the beginning of the new life. Beautiful and very simple baptistries with ivory, I'm sorry, alabaster windows, because they didn't have glass, and you see them as you go along. Now, on, um, on, in Burgos, you have this beautiful window of light, and suddenly you can see the influence of Islam. And of course, Islamic craftsmen were infinitely superior to anything the Christians could rustle up, and so they worked on the many projects on the Camino. That's a beautiful star. This tiny little crucifixion struck me as interesting, because although the moon and sun are part of the iconography of the crucifixion, the sun and the moon, in this case, the moon is very big. Can you see how much bigger it is? So that alerted me to the fact that there's something different about it. And because the moon and the sun um, simply tell of Christ's cosmic um, reach, if you like, and they also pick up on early pre-Christian ideas as well. I was enchanted to find that little moon on a tiny door in a Spanish village, which it tells me that way back, hundreds of years ago, medieval monk, uh, sorry, Islamic family lived right there. So you see the influence of Islam quite a lot carved into this magnificent doorway where you will still see right in the middle the Agnes Day, and somewhere here the Cairo, I think is on one of them, perhaps not this one. Um, and you can see the arches that are at the bottom there are definitely um, Islamic arches and not Gothic arches. Yeah? And you can see how early it is, because you see the dog tooth molding, which is what we have in our Norman cathedrals. So it's a fascinating and completely unique kind of architecture. There the Cairo is right over the door. So absolutely wonderful to explore. When you get to, when you get to Borgos, you have a, effectively a, a Gothic cathedral rising up from nowhere with light pouring through and filtering through its tracery. It's, the Gothic cathedral is about light. It's about light coming into the building and light and prayer going out. Prayer going out, light coming in, it's porous. It's all about light, and that's why it's actually, we can go back to Bernard of Clairvaux in the early 1100s, because he inspired the Gothic architecture. Because the words that he loved most were those words, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light, in him there's no darkness at all. It takes us again back to the mysteries, the idea of the light. So that's why the Gothic architecture is so permeable. Um, and, and then, I'm in Borgos, all of a sudden it's quite sophisticated, you sit in a proper chair and everything, and somebody walking along, topiary, people cycling, and in that empty chair turned out to be a woman from Somerset West which was so exciting. Of course, it rains like mad in Burgos. It, Burgos was Franco's capital, always very rainy and glittery. The streets wet with rain. And going on to Lyon, a massive Gothic cathedral, very, very powerful, full of stained glass. My friend from Somerset West had never seen stained glass and couldn't believe that. Again, massive cathedrals. But it's much more the small things that one takes away. A quick beer at the end of a long walk. This is in Los Arcos, in Los Arcos. Um, and I was so tired, I couldn't even bother to get any water or anything to. I just used my beer to make the drawing. So I made my drawing, put my brush in my beer. So they're beer drawings. Beer drawings. <coughs> um, it's in Los Arcos. I've got to hurry up. Uh, it's in Los Arcos where I saw a very cheap, rubbishy scarf made of nylon, which was orange and lime green, and I flashed through my mind how lovely it would be to have a proper pashmina of real, you know, pashmina. I thought 50% silk, 
brown because I'm supposed to be a pilgrim, shouldn't have luxury. And I thought a nice pashmina would be great. Two days later, I was walking out of Vienna in the pouring rain into a forest, and on the branch over my track, I was totally alone, was the scarf. And I grabbed it off the branch, it was bone dry, and I went to the label, 50% silk, and it was brown, and it was pashmina. <laughs> well, that's the way, it was a gift of the way. So we go on again, Santa Domingo, rain, 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 and then you get to this and you say, no, I can't, I can't do it, this is impossible, but of course you do. And right at the top of this mountain, this cliff, I saw this little offering of a heart made of pebbles with a cross, and I saw there was some writing, so I knelt down and looked at it, and the writing said, Mama, 5th, 5th, 09. And I was there on the 10th of the 5th, 09. So this little girl or man had just fled at the death of his or her mother and walked and had left this. And these are the things you see all the way. Little memories, personal things. We don't know what the story is. We're not even supposed to know. And then certain laws and traditions that crop up. Um, get a couple of twigs, make a cross, stick it in a fence. And this goes on for about two kilometers. Everybody's cross is unique. Everybody's cross tells their story. Everybody's cross is a memory of one person's struggle. Um, the bridges that cross over the water are so significant because a bridge is a symbol of crossing over from your material life to your spiritual life. And there are rivers everywhere, so you do cross. This is Punta La Arena, a beautiful bridge. Uh, it's about 6.30, it looks later, but very early. Um, and drawings of bridges, the Romans built bridges, and you cross those bridges and you thank that you've got a bridge, because if you crossed to the ferry, the ferryman would often extract a toll, even though he wasn't meant to. So it's very, very dark, it's freezing, we're up to, into, um, it's very cold, a straw gust was freezing, there's lightning, there's a storm, I put my, my spare socks on my hands, I don't have any gloves, and I'm frightened of lightning, and luckily I have a wooden staff, and we go on, it gets terribly dark, and in Villafranca, it is dark, and I look at the mountains, and I said, no, mm -mm, that's it, goodbye, I've finished now. And it was actually in Villafranca where many pilgrims died, and that's why they were given a pardon in that particular town. I look at the mountains and said, no, no, no. I thought, well, okay, I'll, d don't laugh straight away. I'll, I'll ask Jesus to take me up the mountain. Well, I asked Jesus, and he said, fine, tomorrow morning, but I do have to go to the bank first. I thought it was so hysterical that Jesus had to go to the bank. So there is Jesus, bless him, beautiful man, look at that face. And Jesus had to go to the bank, then had to get some cabbages and strawberries, and he took me in the car to the top, where it was pouring with rain, and there was nowhere to stay, which he didn't tell me, of course pouring this rain, and he looked and he waved at the, the mountains. I thought after the mountain we'd go down into the promised land, but this is what we saw. And he just waved at it, Galicia, he said pityingly, Galicia, you know. So there I was, and in the pouring rain with nowhere to stay, a ragged wet thing came walking towards me, and I said, who are you? And she said, die easy. Her name was Daisy, but they pronounced it die easy. And